we're going to talk about something we don't normally think about on an everyday basis. Just like it said on the poster, most of us wake up every morning and we think that we're waking up to reality, to the reality. Well, if yes, we will explain, if you really stop and think about it, not many of us ever question the foundational basis of what you're waking up to and what you're calling reality is really based upon, okay? Very seldom does anybody ever question that, those foundational basis. Well, what you're really, what you're really waking up to is really not the reality. What you're waking up to is the interpretation of the reality. That's what you're waking up to. And just think about it. We fight wars over that notion. And you'll see why. Let's, let's get into it. And we'll use the whole notion about sustainability and the notions of conservation, which are very important to our world today and in places like national parks, is a very important, the notion of conservation is very important. I, you know, generally understand sustainability as the collective consciousness of a present day society of all its actions, be they economic, political, social, environmental, and so on, with regard to the impact of those actions on the future generations. It is about the continuity of the society into the future. Okay, that's what the notion of sustainability is about, at least at the way I understand it. Sustainability is an examination of existing practices and norms and how they may affect our future generations. In other words, those newborns and so on, those kids, so on. Sustainability may be interpreted differently by different societies, depending on their metaphysics, and we'll explain those, or paradigms, customs, and values. Now, metaphysics, you know, are things that we wake up with every morning. And those are our criteria for deciding what is real. Metaphysics are our tools for reality structuring. All societies at one time or another claim a territory. In other words, however a society comes into existence, you can, you know, there's many theories. You could ask John Locke, you can ask Rousseau, you can ask different social scientists how a society eventually comes into, you know, coalesces into a society. And within that territory that they eventually claim, through the totality of their relations to the environment, they come up with an interpretive template as to how to structure reality 
resulting in life ways we call customs. Now, and customs are what I would simply put as accepted ways of doing things. And when we write them down, we usually call it law. See, we call it law when we write them down. Okay. Now, <clears throat> along with customs come social values. And these social values act as goals to reach for and also serve as standards for norms. That's what we use as, you know, for judging people. You know, if somebody's abnormal, if somebody's normal, if somebody's not quite, you know, following our ways of doing things. So metaphysics, customs and values are all closely related. And, and all have implications and ramifications, in other words, outgrowths, for the notions of sustainability. In other words, how do we look at sustainability? All right? So, now, different societies, as we said, have different notions and different metaphysics. In other words, different reality structuring. So in other words, hey, we're over here in this part of the world. Hey, somebody else, if we could say down under, hey, they'll have different animals, different plants, different geographical settings, different stars to look at, and so on. So their reality structuring notions, different metaphysics, will be different from somebody else in a different part of the globe, see? So, but Western metaphysics, Here's how a Blackfoot looks at, because I'm outside of it, okay? I'm out, I'm the outsider. And when I'm looking at Westerners, this is how they look to me, <laughs> see? In other words, Westerners think in per perceptually, in perceptual stagnation. In other words, this is the way God made it. God's work is beautiful. Leave it alone. Don't, don't touch it. This is the way God made it. And all you have to do is refer to my drinking buddy, Einstein. <laughs> you know, when he keeps saying, God does not play dice with the universe. In other words, this is the way God made it. It's the way it's going to be forever and a day, okay? Existence consists of matter. In other words, all the space in the universe is really a place for matter. See? That's what, that's part of that reality structure. That's part of those criteria. Space is a place for material objects that humans can sense with our sensory equipment. See. Most everything in the cosmos is inanimate, except for you and I, of course, and those animals out there that we kind of, you know, look down on, okay? And when we come to things like knowledge, knowing, we 
we, we isolate things. We may start out with a broad picture, but we always come down to the point, see? We always come to the point. That's why one true God, one right way of doing things, one right answer, and so on. And the example, simplistic example, I always give is, I'm in grade seven, but I happen to ask a question from grade three, and the teacher says, get with the program. You should have known that in grade three. Get with the program, see. Been there, done, did it. Get with it, see. So, once known, one can move on. Been there, done, did it. Hey, that's all hat. That's all hat. Get with it. And our main referent, always in the back of our mind, is time. Let me tell you, there's no such thing. <laughs> so, so we something we've made up, okay? And out of all these criteria, see, the metaphysics really are the criteria for the reality structuring, see? And that's what we wake up with, those criteria. And that's what we use. We say, hey, every morning, here, this is reality. But in, rea but in fact, they're just a template for reality structure, see? And the social values that have arisen out of those criteria include, not limited to these, but these are examples, are bigger, is always better than smaller, faster, newer, higher, and so on, singularity, linearity, and so on. Those have all risen up out of those criteria, out of that template, see? So a product of Western meta paradigms is that came up was this was in back about 600 years ago, six, 700 years ago was the age of reason. And here, this is just a little bit of a historical view, okay? And the reason I'm throwing this in is because, hey, if you go to the Apple store and show them your iPhone, guess what they'll say? This is out of date, thinking about linearity. Why don't you get an iPhone 13, see? Even though your phone is still working perfectly, okay? Well, those criteria, those metaphysics, we really think about them do you think they need don't you think they need a little bit of updating <laughs> see the age of reason came into existence during the in the 16th century in europe it was a paradigmatic and ideological and uh, philosophical movement it is about rationality, a belief that you can come to know or arrive at truth strictly through reason, as opposed to faith, reliance on the past, intuition, 
and this notion of metaphysics. It gave rise to deism. In other words, the church jumped on the bandwagon and started, started to say, hey, God made an orderly, orderly universe, and it is good and beautiful. God does not play dice, see? So, you know, that's what, the, in, because at that, the time, at the time, what was happening was because it was the church that was educated, they were the ones writing the books, reading, they were the educated. And the divine rule of kings, the monarchs, also were the educated. They were the ones with the libraries. The commoners did not have the access. While the commoners eventually said, hell with them. We don't need those libraries. We can come to know just through pure reason. See, that's what that philosophical movement, uh, the Enlightenment period, some people refer to it as. See, and the ramifications of that Enlightenment area was that the, it was a counter movement to the old establishment of the divine rule of kings, as we've said. It had, it had the, it had, because it attempted to subject anything and everything to rationalism, it did away with the subjective and dealt with only the objective. That's why in science, scientists pride themselves as being very objective in their work. It did away with emotions and feelings. For instance, hey, women were too emotional to be good scientists or leaders. Hey, you know, and we're still seeing, you know, the undoing of that today, you know, separation of church and state came into existence because of that. Say. Now, the scientific method in the age of reason was that mysticism, miracles, ghosts, and the like were frowned upon measurement, and hence the age of mathematics came into existence. It was the, it was the basis of the scientific revolution, measurement. Experimentation and pure reason can bring about knowledge. For instance, if any of you follow science, Higgs particle, for instance, the scientists began to say, hey, you know, we're all familiar with E equals MC squared. Well, E stands for energy. <clears throat> and MC squared stands for matter. But how does that energy transform into matter. Well, there has to be a phase somewhere in between, see, the scientists were saying. And so they said, that Higgs particle has to be somewhere over here in between. So it was all what I would refer to as being all propositional, see. And it's weight, it should be here, it should be filling this space over here, and so on. So there is no room for anything that cannot be measured, and everything, as we said, is propositional.
not about experience, was an experiential. See? Well, when we have a good understanding of what those metaphysics do to us, and we apply them to notions of conservation. What happens? Okay, well, here we're talking about ecological conservation. There are other types of conservation, as we will see. Ecological conservation, for instance, speaks to balancing ecosystems wildlife populations, be they at risk or not, biodiversity of the landscape, whether for research or enjoyment. In other words, kind of a utilitarian notion. See? A utilitarian perspective usually looks at everything from the greatest happiness it will bring to mankind. See? It never looks at things from the benefit it might bring to the land or the animals themselves, See? or to the plant life. But a problem arises. What's the problem? Well, the problem is mainly a linguistic problem. Did you know that? Well, let's show you. See, English, like other Euro languages, is very good at categorizations. It's a very good language for categorizing and making distinctions. Now, so we have a whole bunch of different types of con conservations, for instance. Here is a partial list found in an article online. I just went online and I copy these down just as an example. Conservation biology, conservation law, conservation movement, energy conservation, marine conservation, habitat conservation, conservation science, soil conservation, water conservation, wetland conservation, wildlife conservation, wildlife management, and the list goes on, see? But the thing is, each of them work in their own little silos, and that's the problem. They all work in their own little silos. But the main problem again is a linguistic problem. English is a language that leans towards binary oppositions, either ors, good, bad, saint, sinner, black, white, day, night. You can just go down the list and see the boundary between good and bad, let's say, is watertight. You cannot cross it. So you could not be a saint and a sinner at the same time. You're always either or. So when it comes to conservation, either it is either utilitarian with good management or preservation. And the debate goes on. When we look at national parks, let's say like Banff National Park, what side of the fence are our national parks? 
utilitarian or preservation. See, sometimes they don't know which side they're on. You can look at, you can look sometimes just like in museums, you can look, but don't touch. See? But on the other hand, there is some utilitarian aspect to it, just like we see here. Hey, skiing, hiking, you know, swimming, and so on. In some cases, the debate between preservation and use, but with good management, seems more important than the actual practice of conservation. It becomes a culture of meetings as opposed to a culture of doing. Why? Because of those categorizations, everybody in their own little silos, and so on. And neither work together. We all carve out a little niche, and so on. Native people come along and say, hey, we want to talk holistic. And we have a hard time. I can't cover that because my, my funding only speaks to this. <laughs> See, I can't do the other thing you're talking about. See, we get caught in those. In other words, that's where the bureaucracy bureaucratic frustrations arise. See? See the picture? And it's that linguistic problem. Now, when we look at it from a Blackfoot perspective, Blackfoot metaphysics include notions of flux, in other words, everything is always in motion. Everything is always changing, transforming, reforming, and so on. Existence consists of energy waves. It's not about matter. It's about energy waves. And in fact, those energy waves are what we refer to as the spirit. So when Native people are talking about spirit, they're really talking about energy waves. See? And it's the energy waves that are in that flux. So you and I are just a combination of energy waves. And when those energy waves dissipate, you and I are no more. The, the energy waves themselves are still in existence, but that particular combination is not there anymore. See? Everything is animate. Because wherever there's, whenever there's any kind of motion, there's life. See? So everything is animate. Even those rocks, the trees, and so on. Everything is alive. Renewal. We always renew things. We sing the same songs. We tell the same stories. We do the same ceremonies year in, year out. So when I asked that grade three question, hey, my teacher will, hey, yeah, it's a renewal thing. They'll tell me. They'll retell me the story 
We sing me the song, so on. And maintenance of those conditions and factors that make for the present reality and without which humans cannot survive as a species. In other words, you and I live in a very narrow gap of ideal conditions for our survival. And if you play around with those ideal factors, ideal conditions, we won't last very long. In fact, if you do a little bit of research, scientists are already talking the new species. In other words, the new species that are going to take over for humans. I jokingly always say, I used to text Neanderthal man. Where is he now? See, he's long gone. In other words, ideal conditions for him didn't last long or disappeared. We, we, we stayed when we're still in place. But if we keep doing the things we're doing, we may not be around for too long. See? So those things that without which humans cannot survive, if you don't believe that, stop breathing for 20 minutes. <laughs> See if you, if you can, you will stay alive. Sustaining the land upon which the present human reality depends on, which is part of that holistic view, and language acts as a repository for all of the knowledge that arises out of those metaphysics. The language is just like that flux. It's very action, very process oriented. See? Let me give you some interesting example, an interesting example. I say, I'm going to lay down. If you, if I say in Blackfoot, that's just tokshit. Translated, and you know, if you ask another Blackfoot speaker to translate that, the easy translation is, I'll lay down. But the real deep, deeper translation is, I'm going to make myself thin. I'm going to make myself thin. Remember those energy waves? OK. So if I'm laying myself thin, maybe, not, not, maybe fewer energy waves are going to hit me, penetrate through me. See, get the picture. So that's a difference, very big difference in the language. I can talk to you all day about differences in the language. Now, if you apply the Blackfoot metaphysics to conservation, what do we get? Well, all of existence is animate. It is about all my relations. Those trees are my relations. Even those rocks, the river, the bears, you know, the birds, they're all my relations. So if they're all my relations, hey, I sing to them. 
and communicate with them. I treat them as my relatives. Very different than the biblical notion, everything is for the benefit of man. Everything is inanimate. See, I can do anything to them, to them because they're, it's inanimate. Existence is about a web of relationships. What you do to the land, to the animals, to the water, you do to yourself. If you respect your relatives, they will respect you. It is all about good relationships. Here are some of these relationships. How are some of these relationships established? Well, focus on cultural keystone species, such as the buffalo. See, the buffalo is an eco-engineer and a sustenance provider. Our songs, our stories, and our ceremonies are very closely related to the buffalo, to Inewa. Through its eco-engineering of the landscape, the buffalo has taught us many lessons about the land, plants, and other animals. See, the buffalo used to go in a big circle out on the plains. It would winter close to the mountains for shelter and so on, come out on the plains and come all the way around. By the time it's winter, it'll be back in the mountains. And guess what? Hey, we followed that buffalo. It was, and it was such that it sing, there was synchronization. When we reached certain places, certain plants were ready for harvest. Whether they were for food, whether they were for medicinal purposes, and so on. See? And hey, by the time you come back, hey, you had your, you had your Costco shelves, you know, stocked up for the winter. And you can also look at that movement like a big medicine wheel. See, that's what that buffalo was was uh, showing us. That's what we're talking about. Learning our spiritual, spiritual responsibility to the ecosystem, that responsibility includes learning about plant and animal communities, because certain plants and, you know, grow in communities. Certain animals grow in and hang around together, so on. And their life ways, you know, they spend their lives together. We talk and sing to them. We have songs for different animals and so on, different plants and so on. We sing to them. They teach us songs. In fact, this place, We've had many people from different places that are not from here tell us, hey, I woke up with this song here in Banff, and it's not one of our songs, traditional songs, but I woke up with this song here, and they sing the song, yeah, we tell them, geez, it, that sounds like a Blackfoot song. 
So they place us, those animals do teach us those songs. Many ceremonies are specific to places, to animals, and to plants. What you do to the ecosystem, as we've said before, you do to yourself. The, the reciprocity approach to conservation results in continuity and or restoration of your culture, language, life ways, and so on. When I cannot fish or hunt, a little bit of me disappears. So in other words, when a national park was established, hunting was prohibited. When I used to come out and our people used to come out and hunt over here. When I couldn't come and conduct the ceremonies, we used to have at certain sites here, a little bit of me disappears. It's just, if you're a good Christian, hey, you can be Christian all you want. But if you can't go to that little corner church anymore, see, if all the crosses were, were taken away, hey, or something missing, you start to become just a little bit less Christian. See? That's what was happening. In other words, that's why our elders say, I am the environment, and the environment is me. See? The Three Sisters <clears throat> is an example of conservation and sustainability. Corns, beans, and squash, they complement each other. Corn provides the climbing pole for the beans. The beans bring nitrogen. The squash provides a protective cover to hold the moisture, you know, for the other plants. In other words, a relationship exists. They form the community. The three sisters are not just about providing food for humans. They are about re replenishing Mother Earth and ecological balance, just like the buffalo does. So, Northern Plains Indians, you know, usually the Plains Indians are not well known for, you know, big, being real, you know, big agriculturists. We were more big hunters, big game hunters, and so on. But we did some. The buffalo was a tiller of soil. You know, the buffaloes used to dance. You know, right? so that there would be new growth and so on. The buffalo irrigated the land through their development of wallows. Northern Plains Indians did some planting, such as tobacco. We used to plant tobacco for our ceremonies. And to a very large extent, harvesting was actually part of replenishing. See? So, our people, our elders, always remind us about thinking of our children. Seven generations into the future. When you think about it, Generally, social scientists think about a generation being about 30 years. 
in span? Well, if we went by that, in other words, our elders are always thinking 200 plus years ahead. In other words, hey, sustainability, thinking about those, what we do today, what it's going to do to our children 200 years from now. That's, that's sustainability, that's sustainable thinking. Western science is really all about exploration. Let's go find out. Let's see what we can do. Native science is aimed at this notion of sustainability. Well-being practices were aimed at sustainable sustainability. It was not about capitalism. Remember that notion of renewal? That part of the paradigm that speaks to, hey, maintaining. So, the lesson to be learned from these comparisons and these notions of metaphysics and how we think and so on every time we wake up and how they influence concepts like conservation and sustainability is that we live in a very narrow spectrum as we've said conditions required for our existence. If we, if we are going to survive as a species, we must maintain those conditions. Otherwise, we will be a passing phase. If a third world war were to start from this Ukrainian invasion, going to be no holes bar you know it'll be it'll, it'll be the end of us most likely so what is missing right now in western in a western dominated world is ceremony remember the notion of rationalism while well, ceremony is, is missing and respect for the environment and that ecological balance. Truth and reconciliation from 2015 gave us a wake up call to examine those metaphysical bases that we carry about on a daily basis. Reconciliation requires a synergistic approach to relationship. It cannot be an imbalanced approach. It takes, it takes time to take a hard look at our standard models and to ask ourselves, where are those standard models taking us? And we need to examine, ask ourselves those hard questions. TRC gave us the opportunity to stop and reflect. And the positive side of COVID-19 is that it is giving us a, an opportunity, another opportunity besides TRC to stop and reflect. So in our reflecting moments, 
when we're talking sustainability, let's engage in some spiritual responsibility and sing and talk to all our relations. That would be the message I would like to leave with you this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Leroy has graciously uh, said we can have a few questions from the audience. So if anyone has any questions for us, thank you, Leroy, so much. Yeah. Thank you. Those, those are all such good reminders, and we have to realize when we're slipping into Western thought. Does anyone have any questions? Can we talk? <laughs> <laughs> In the back there? Hi, sorry. Um, so I was writing down everything you said, and we have culture of meaning versus a culture of being. What we as a community can do moving forward is to really be in there. Can you say that one more time, a little sl sorry. more slowly? Um, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, what can like BAM do as a community to move forward in sustainability um, through an Indigenous perspective? And she referred to that idea of the culture of meaning versus the culture of doing. Oh, kind of okay. By that. Yeah. We've all dealt with bureaucracies, okay? And what happens in bureaucracies is we've developed a, a culture of meetings. We never get through the agenda and we just say, okay, let's set up the next meeting, okay? And we never get around to the actual doing, okay? We never say, okay, we've reached an agreement. We've said this is what we're going to do. Let's go out and do it, okay? So it's an endless, it's an endless meeting, meeting, meeting. But pretty soon we forget what we were meeting about. <laughs> and that's what bureaucracies do to us and that's what i mean when you have a whole bunch of silos of different conservation programs and so on hey we, we don't talk in many cases we don't even talk to each other from silo to silo we were We've, in fact, we were discovering in one instance where in one school, all the different faculties and so on, hey, they were even using the same elders from the same reserve throughout, throughout the college and the university, and they weren't you know, they weren't sharing the information with each other. Waste of time and money. <laughs> That's what I was referring to. Yeah. I was wondering, Leroy, you called it the Blackfoot metaphysics um, way of seeing. Do you think um, many other Western First Nations would have a similar view? I'm, I was coming at it from Blackfoot because that's what I grew up in and I speak the language and so on. But I do know Cree is very similar, Nakoda is very similar and so on. There might be little idiosyncratic differences here and there and so on, but overall very similar. There was somebody else back there too. Yeah. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, can you say more about your last slide there? Uh, the last 
bullet point. Let's take spiritual responsibility and sing to our rel relation. But how do we, as Western meta metaphysicals, transition to this uh, this sort of black or indigenous metaphysics? And how, how many generations is that going to take? And can you say a little bit more about the practice that we could partner on on how to move ourselves into this sort of metaphysics that you're describing? Well, the thing is, we've become, as we were saying, see, in Western science, if it's not measurable, it's not scientific. Okay. And it's a very rationalistic approach. And anything that's not anything that's not measurable. Can you measure love? Can you measure emotions? No. So those are fall way outside of science. See. In health, for instance, can you measure social determinants of health, such as, such as stress factors? Say, if you go see a doctor, they won't pay much attention to stress factors, so on. Well, the thing is, that rationalism, that rationalist approach from the Enlightenment era to the forward to our present time has done away to a very large extent the notion of this spiritual notion. Say. And everything, you know, is only about the matter, knock on wood, okay? That's the only thing that's real. Okay. And everything outside of that, hey. Whereas other, other types of metaphysics doesn't exclude the Western notions, but go beyond them. See? They include those, but go beyond those, and include those. And I'll give you a different type of example, so that in Western thought, see, we limit ourselves when we're drawing on something for information information, we, we limit ourselves to a state of awakeness, okay? Only what you see, feel, etc., in a state of awakeness is what we would refer to using those paradigmatic bases as real. But see, other, other, other sets of metaphysics like Blackfoot, hey, dreams are part of my experience. They're actually experiences. I can draw on dreams, maybe not every dream, but I can draw on dreams for some information. So some songs, in fact, come to me in a dream, and I wake up with the song. Okay. I wonder how Beethoven gets his songs, his music. See. So when we're talking spirituality, it's, we're talking about those energy waves as opposed to the notion of matter. So 
it would be a paradigmatic shift. Now, we're not saying forget. Forget this. We're saying include. You know, paradigmatic shift that would expand so that if we, Western science is about measurement, Blackfoot science is about relationships. If it's not about relationships, it's not scientific. But if you put the two together, you'll have a much broader window to look through. And therefore, a much broader window to take information from. And maybe new scientific discoveries. Because as of now, it's been over 70 years, maybe closer to 80 years now, in quantum physics, we haven't made any new scientific discoveries because we're looking through just the one window, narrow window. There hasn't been a, all our scientific toys. You have to make the distinction between science and technology. Science is about discovering something that we don't know. It's kind of stretching the envelope. Okay. Technology is application of the known. So all our technology today, we knew the science behind it 60, 70 years ago, maybe even longer. We knew them. Technology is just catching up. So the energy waves and matter notion is where we're talking about the spiritual responsibility. I don't know if we answered your question. It's, it's hard. Because, because of the language, see, the language is that notion about either or. See, it's hard to transcend those watertight boundaries. Yeah. One more question. Well, this picks up on exactly the point of language. I was fascinated by the way you grounded it all in a linguistic problem. And it's related to the last question because I'm left thinking, okay, how do I think about ceremony as somebody who's thinking in English? So you did say, I could talk to you all day about the differences between uh, European languages and Blackfoot. And I know that's a huge, huge complicated subject. But could you give us like your top five tips or something like, <laughs> <laughs> between the languages? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you mind going back there? Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Amethyst's favorite example is <clears throat> the notion of dog. Okay. And again, if you ask another Blackfoot speaker to translate dog into English, you know, in Blackfoot, we would say imitao. And if you ask a Blackfoot speaker to translate it into English, they would just simply say dog. But the deeper translation is a being, a being, and we don't define the being, a being of some kind, that's on the move. Because when you stop and think about that flux notion, things can change forms, transform, and so on. So it, things are never fixed. They may appear this way for now, 
but it can change, transform any time. Okay. So trans the notion of transformation is daily, is something we deal with all the time. It's not new thought. Okay. Einstein caused the scientific revolution when he said, time and distance are the same thing. Okay. Well, that's old hat in Blackfoot. <laughs> somebody we see over there in the distance and somebody that I saw a month ago. I talk about them in the same way. Okay. And so I can count to, to infinity in Blackfoot. Might take me all day to see when I come to the millions and billions, but I can count. But the point is, what's the point, you know, if it's going to be infinity? Uh, yeah. So, but the thing is, the thing is, see a very another very simplistic example is your ordinary English sentence, your ordinary English sentence is structured as A is B. A is B. Okay. Well, think about it. If A is B, if A equals B, why do you need B? <laughs> so that brings up a whole different way of thinking because in English, it begins to say you always need the other. You always need the other. In Blackfoot, you're it. You just need the A. You don't need the B. So those, those are. Thank you. Yeah. There's one. It don't matter who comes to Banff, and I'll give you one example. We're talking about water, okay? Did you know that as we're all sitting here, that every one of us is 60 to 65% water? We're all here. We're all 60 to 65% water. All adults are 60 to 65% water. Brand new baby, newborn baby, 70 to 80% water. I am the environment. So what I do to the water, I'm doing to myself. So don't matter who comes to Banff, whatever their, and the water here on the earth, 
all of the water on the earth, only 3% of it is fresh water. That's what we all live on. And we're close to 8 billion of us on this earth now. That's what we're fighting over. And we're not treating it very well. See, So what we do to the water, we're doing to ourselves. And that's what we mean. Hey, if we don't do the balancing, we may not last long. Some new species that doesn't need water may come in. <laughs> yeah. well, I think Thank you. All love to just stay here all night with the three rides. Who, who wants a master class with the three <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A special gift for Leroy, and it's speaking of motion, it's going to accessorize his electric bike that he got for his 80th birthday. So uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, thanks so much. Oh, thank you so yeah. much. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. And thanks everyone who allowed this to happen tonight.